a session number four tonight. And this is part two of Alive While Dead. But before we get into that, I, want you, I hope you have your Bibles. I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Revelation 6. We will be there in a couple of minutes, and we're going to study another text in Revelation also. But if you saw last night's message, it was foundational for this one. These all build on each other, so hopefully you caught that one either in person or on the stream. And we looked at what, what Paul called the dead in Christ. And do you remember what happens at the second coming to the dead in Christ? They put on immortality. Immortality, don't they? And then we who are alive and remain also put on immortality and we are caught up together to meet the Lord in the air with the formerly dead in Christ who are raised at the second coming of Jesus. But did you wonder as we were going through that, what about those who are not in Christ, right? What about those who are alive on the earth who have, who have not accepted the gospel and those who are in the grave who never accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ. So today's topic is, well, well, the question is, will they put on immortality? Today's topic is hellfire. And unfortunately, this is a sober reality. Unfortunately for the wicked, hellfire is real. It's, it's a real biblical reality. Fortunately, for any person who wants to have eternal life, who loves Jesus, it's a free gift of salvation. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal what? Eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that's the beautiful, powerful assurance that we can all have. Alive while dead, part two. Eternal life for everybody. The question is, do the wicked stay alive for eternity like the righteous do? Do they acquire immortality like the righteous do? The issue of hell is probably surrounded by more popular misconception than any teaching in the Bible. This one is going to get a, a twisted truth untangled. You've heard of that free resource. When we look at seven deadly myths in Christianity, this one has a stranglehold within Christianity. How about this mythical, cartoonish version of hell? The ruler of the underworld. Below the surface of the earth, perhaps right at the center of the earth, is hell. This is the devil's home. Satan ruleth over the realm with his demon minions beside him. Day and night they oversee the tortured dungeon known as hell, where at the behest of an all-powerful, punishing God of heaven, Satan torments the immortal souls of the living dead. From the moment they die, the lost immortal soul is extracted from the body, dragged down to where there are rotisseries, steaks, and other methods of barbecuing the souls of the lost. There are a number of circles of hell heading inward. The greater the sinner, the greater the punishment, purgatory for those who need to only pay a little for their sin before being transported to heaven. But the ninth circle of hell, for the most wicked of sinners, the devil laughs an evil laugh as he tortures souls day after day. And Jesus stands by, satisfied to see the punishments continue. Carry on, he says to his servant Satan. That was, that was hard to finish, by the way. <laughs> that took way too long. Um, that was so absurdly cartoonish, nonsensically insane, unbiblical, not a single part of that little routine that we just had to all endure together is from the Bible. Not an ounce of it. It was all totally made up by man, for, by Satan, you can say. We can track the history of this. This is the teaching of Dark Ages Christianity. So we're going to study tonight, what does the Bible teach about hell? Where is hell is going to be question number one. When is hell, question number two. And for how long is hell, question number three. But first we have to look at this Hebrew word that is often translated as hell in some English translations. Erroneously translated as hell. And it is called Sheol. Sheol. Now you can get out... And then the Greek version of it in the New Testament is Hades. You can get out a concordance. I hope you study your Bibles. Get out a concordance and look up every use of the word Sheol in the Hebrew Old Testament. And you will discover what Sheol is and what it is not. 
Now, can I just give you a few on the screen, because we don't have time to do every one, but I want to give you a few, and just from this glimpse of these few, you will be able to identify what Sheol is and what it is not, even though it is translated with the English word hell. Is this hell? Is, is, is this hell? Sheol is where, where righteous Job expected to go and rest while dead. It is where righteous David expected to go until the resurrection. It is where animals go when they die. You already know what Sheol is, don't you? It is where the dead have their bed. It is where the soul decays. It is where the dead are laid down and covered by worms. You've probably driven by a place where this has occurred, in a graveyard, in a cemetery, right? Sheol is not the, con the Dark Ages conception of hell. Sheol is simply the grave. Now, there is a real hell. But Sheol isn't it. And that brings us to our first question. When is the real hell? We're going to do when, where, and for how long. Do you remember the parable of the weeds and the wheat when we studied that Sabbath morning in session two, Matthew 13? It, it declared that there, the weeds will be burned up in the furnace of fire, meaning the wicked will be burned up in the furnace of fire and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. That sounds like a literal real hell to me. When does this parable say it will take place? Let's bring it back up on the screen. The harvest is the end of the world. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be when. Don't you love how plain the Bible is? At the end of the age is when the tares will be burned up. It is the end of the world, the end of the age. Stated two times there, the punishment of the wicked takes place then. Which only makes sense because if hell punish hellfire punishment were going on right now before the judgment is completed, that would be a strange form of justice to be dishing out punishments prior to the judgment, wouldn't it? In fact, 2 Peter 2 verse 9 tells us about that very issue. It says, the Lord knoweth how to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. So the unjust are reserved unto a future day of punishment, and that is the day of judgment. So not yet right now. But even more to the point, you might be just saying, Scott, we already studied last night that we don't have immortality naturally, so can the w dead wicked even be in hell alive right now while dead? Well, no, that's why this is part two of last night. We're looking at myth number three for two nights consecutive here. Myth number three is that we possess immortality naturally so that we remain alive while dead, haunting people or living in heaven or in hell. You would have to have an immortal soul in order to have that center of the earth weird scenario of immortal souls being tormented while dead. So God alone is immortal we studied last night we are to seek immortality we saw last night we also saw the, the bible describes many times death as a sleep i won't repeat all of that but you're you're aware that the theology that you got as a kid from looney tunes or whatever is 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 once again proven incorrect um, you remember the little cartoon would die and the angel would come and extract the immortal soul and if the little cartoon was good then he would go up on a cloud and be issued a harp and a uh and a halo and he would begin singing and if the cartoon was the bad cartoon he would go down into the center of the earth and be on the rotisserie right I mean the Bible does not say the Dark Ages Church said it but the Bible doesn't say that anybody is burning in hell right now yet it is coming it is real it is literal but it is yet future as Jesus said at the end of the world at the harvest meaning the end of the age, is when the weeds will be burned in the fire. Now let's do a little timeline on that, because you know that in the near future, Jesus returns. This is our blessed hope. And we studied those texts last time, that the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and we are caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. I'm going to come and receive you unto myself so you can be where I am with me. So let's sum that up with the saved are given immortality and taken to heaven at the second coming of Jesus. That's what we saw last night. But what about the living wicked? Let's go to Revelation 6 and we'll see what happens when Jesus comes. And we're going to start in verse 14, okay? And the heaven departed as a scroll. Don't you love that song, It Is Well With My Soul, the verse where the sky recedes as a scroll. That is a beautiful picture of Jesus' second coming. And I, in verse 14, 
when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? So this sounds a little different than what the righteous say. When, G when we see Jesus, we go, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. He will save us. They are running away into the caves, away into the mountains, and calling on the rocks to fall on them, and they don't want us. The, the glory of God is too much for them. Well, what happens next? In Revelation 7, it talks about a different issue that we're going to study in a, in a coming session. So remember this text we just studied. It's very key, but... What happens next chronologically is revealed in 2 Peter. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. This is the second coming of Jesus, the day of the Lord. And the elements will melt with fervent heat. And both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. So this is a pretty horrific thought. They're running away because this is a cataclysmic event for planet earth and for sinners. For us, it's a joyful event. For the dead in Christ, we're going up. But what are they doing? They are running away because everything's being destroyed and melted with fervent heat before the, the brightness of the Lord's coming. Jeremiah 25, 33 says that the wicked are slain from one end of the earth to the other. And I don't even want to have to dwell on that, but this is a reality of this fallen world and of the plan of redemption, how sin and suffering and pain and evil will be an annihilated for eternity. This is part of that process. And what is God's attitude toward those who are slain, those who didn't receive the gospel? Listen to this in Ezekiel. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his evil way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die? This is Jesus, like he said to the, to the Jews, I want to gather you under my wing like a mother hen. And they were rebelling against him. These are those in Ezekiel who are going to die because of the rebellion against God. That's how God feels even about us in our sin. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Remind me again, who is raised at the second coming of Jesus in 1 Thessalonians 4? Let's look at it on the screen just to make sure from last time. And the dead in Christ will rise first. So we've got three of the four figured out here. The dead in Christ are rising, and we who are alive and remain who are in Christ will be caught up together to be with them in the, in, in the air. Then the wicked are slain from one end of the earth to the other who are living when Jesus comes again. Now, Jesus actually talks about two different resurrections because there's still the wicked dead that we haven't figured out from the Bible yet. Jesus says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of what? Of life. And to those who have done evil to the res resurrection of what? So there's two resurrections, aren't there? The resurrection unto life and the resurrection unto condemnation. And as we study actually in Revelation chapter 20, which you can turn to right now, we're going to see that these two resurrections are separated by a 1,000 year period of time. Uh, Daniel 12, verse 2, by the way, also references the two resurrections. It says that those who are sleeping in the dust will arise, some will arise to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Revelation 20 gives us more of the timeline, though. As we're getting on toward when is hell, it's going to be involving this chapter, Revelation 20, that we'll study the first ten verses of together. Let's begin in verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon. Now, I got to pause right there. Remember, Revelation uses symbolism to teach literal realities. So you're imagining the symbolism right now, this great dragon, and he's being thrown into the abyss with a chain. And it says, it says in verse 3, And cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal on him. 
Now, what is the literal meaning behind this symbolism? We know who the dragon is. It says that in verse 2, that the, the devil and that's the old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. And he's bound in verse 2 for a thousand years. He's cast into the bottomless pit. Now, when you look that English word up in the Greek, it's the word abyssos which is the same word used in Genesis 1, verse 2, in the Greek version of the book of Genesis. Genesis 1, verse 2 is when the earth is formless and void. Do you remember that? It's without form and void at that time. Same word, abyssos. And so what we're seeing here is a pre-creation state of planet earth. Boy, that sounds like the elements melt with fervent heat and everything in the works on the earth are burned up. Let's read the rest of verse 3. We're going to see the literal meaning of this because it says that he should deceive the nations no more. You want to understand this chain. You want to understand this abyss. You look at this issue of formless and void and he can't deceive anybody. Why can't he deceive anybody? Hmm, let's keep studying. I think it'll become very clear here. He can't deceive anybody, I'm in verse 3, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. Now for a thousand years, he's in this formless and void place, this abyssos, this, 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 this chained up, not being able to deceive anybody context. You can imagine when the earth is laid waste and void, what he must be feeling at this moment. All he has done for 6,000 years is deceive. That's his very mission statement. And he's now got a thousand years to think it over, doesn't he? Nobody's there to deceive. Now, where are we at this time as the righteous? Let's read in verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. Then I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, we'll study that later this week, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. They lived. We know that resurrection, don't we? We just studied it. Jesus said, some will come to the, everlast the, 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 the resurrection unto everlasting life. They lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Go to verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. So is the first resurrection a good resurrection? That's a good resurrection. You're blessed and holy if you are raised in the first resurrection. Now go to verse 5. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand year years were finished. The rest of the dead, the ones who aren't blessed and holy, is that the resurrection you want to come up in? Not at all, because that's not the blessed and holy one. And you'll see what happens as we continue to study this, what happens to that group who are not in the blessed and holy resurrection. But let's get the timing down here in verse 5. When is the second resurrection the not blessed and holy one? It says in verse 5, the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. That's why the devil's all alone and can't deceive anybody. Because those who were alive and remained got immortality and went to heaven. The dead in Christ went to heaven. The wicked who were alive are slain. And the rest of the dead, the, the unrighteous, the lost, are, are still in the grave and haven't had their resurrection till the end of this thousand years. So the devil's there for a thousand years with no humans. Reading on in verse 7. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. What is his prison? Well, it was when he couldn't deceive anybody. Read in verse 8. He's not in a prison anymore in verse 8 and shall go out to deceive the nations. So he's not chained up with this circumstance of not being able to deceive anybody anymore. He is deceiving some people at, after the thousand years were expired. Now, who is he deceiving after the thousand years are expired? Well, we just heard about that other resurrection after the thousand years. That was mentioned in verse 5. So in verse 7, when the thousand years are expired, and in verse 8, he is deceiving. You know who he's deceiving here, those who came out in the wrong resurrection here. So the wicked are alive in verse 8. Now, he's going from the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Now, I want to pause right there, because this is 
thick drama right here. This is the conflict of the ages coming to a head. And what you're about to see is going to be the answer to our question, when is hell? But, and where is hell? But even more importantly, put this in the broader context of what's about to happen here. And, and everything about the problem of evil and evil and pain and suffering and how long, O oh Lord, all those things we discussed. We're going to see this end right now in the, in, the, in the prophecy. So this is an exciting moment. I want you to see in, in chapter 21, real quick, 21 verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I had to read that to you right now because you're going to see a city upon the earth in the next verse here, in verse 9 of chapter 20. And Revelation 20 and 21 isn't all sequential in chronological order. It's done topically. And that's why it's like this resurrection is mentioned here and then that one is mentioned there even though they're a thousand years apart. And then the city is here, but the city is down here. Because what John is doing here is taking it topic by topic, not, not going sequentially or chron chronologically. So this city comes down. You see it in 21 verse 2. We know when it came down because in verse 9, here's what happens. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. See, the city has come down at this point from heaven. So here we are upon the earth after the thousand years in the city. The devil is outside of the city. He's marshalling his forces. All of the wicked who were dead have come to life at that second resurrection. And that's everybody. That's who died at the second coming of Jesus too. So this is all humans who've ever lived are in one place at one time. Some inside the city, some outside the city. And what happens next is powerful. It says in verse 9, And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. They literally tried to attack the city. And God says, Enough, the weeds and the wheat have grown to maturity. This demonstration of Satan's principles is all the universe will ever need to be eternally secure. We can end it now. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. In verse 10, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. This is pretty heavy stuff, isn't it? The way Peter puts it, remember, the heavens and the earth are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So we've got the when and the where now, don't we? It's the day of judgment in the future at the harvest at the end of the age. And here this verse gives us the when also. 2 Peter 3, 7 told us the heavens and the earth. You saw that they were upon the breadth of the earth. It's at that place and at that time in the future when the city is there and they are upon the earth trying to assault and overtake the city of God, the new Jerusalem, that hell takes place. The lake of fire, it called it. And they were devoured as fire came down out of heaven from God. So the Bible doesn't say hell is located in the center of the earth. We got some super clear, awesome biblical reality that we can go, wow, okay, so everything I've heard from wherever, uh, from cartoons to dark ages mythology to stuff from Greek paganism to things that infect even Protestantism, I can go on the Bible alone and I can get very clear answers for this. Now, do you think the Bible's also going to give us a very clear answer for the big question? How long is hell? How long is hell is the one that's just bathed with so much of a chokehold of deception in Christianity today. And, and, and the Bible is very, very clear. Just like last night, we were like, wow, this is way more clear than anything that I thought could be from the Bible. How did we all get that wrong about what happens when we die? This one is going to be just as clear. But that Dark Ages myth is very, very potent, so we've got to take it step by step here. Now, we know when the righteous receive immortality, right? We looked at the texts. We won't repeat that. But are there any texts, and if there are, where are they, in the Bible that say that the wicked receive immortality? We know the righteous receive immortality at the second coming of Jesus. Do the wicked ever receive immortality? You're scanning your memory of the Bible. You've got to read the Bible for yourself cover to cover because you can't prove a negative. You've got to go through it. <laughs> Did I find any? No, I didn't find any. So um, I didn't find any. I've read it. I hope you've read it. We should read it. Um, None, not a single verse in the Bible says that the wicked ever receive immortality. The Bible says the opposite. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. Don't you love how plain and clear? It's like, this is how I would say that to my three-year-old daughter. Like, so clear and simple. 
He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. And we don't have to wonder if the wicked acquire immortality because we know we're not naturally immortal. The first lie of the devil, the first myth, if you will, was you will not surely die. So if you think about it, most of Christianity is teaching that the wicked have immortality and live on forever. That living eternally happens for everybody. That's why the title of tonight's message is Eternal Life for Everybody. That they stay alive in the fire of hell forever and ever, never to die ever. And that they are immortal in the fire and that the fire never kills them. Well, what does the Bible say? Are you ready for a bunch of texts? Because I hope you're taking notes or you have a good memory because we're going to hit a lot of them in a short period of time. Let's start with Jesus' words on this. He says, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to, what's the next word there? Destroy both soul and body in hell. So according to Jesus, the soul of the wicked will be destroyed in hell. And you might say, well, that makes perfect sense because I know what a soul is from last night's message. A soul is the sum of two component parts, body and breath. And so the body and the very living being that is the wicked person is going to be destroyed by that fire. When they come out of the grave after that thousand years, they don't come out with immortality. They come out with the same mind, character, and, and, and intentions that they went in with, and they're deceived by Satan, and they join the assault on the city. They're a physical person uh, in, in, in a different sense that we are. When we're translated to heaven, we're physical, but we are immortal. They are still mortal at that point because the Bible doesn't say they acquire immortal anywhere. They go into that fire, that lake of fire, not as a disembodied soul. There's no such thing as a disembodied soul. A soul requires dust to exist and breath and so body and soul destroyed, Jesus said. Now, here's a real one that blew my mind when I was first studying this out. John 3.16 the, the gospel, in a nutshell. Best verse, right? Most well-known verse. John 3.16 actually lays this out very clearly. It says that whoever just believes in him shall not, fill in the blank, shall not perish, but have eternal life. So God gives us two options, doesn't he? And this isn't the only text. There's so many that say this. It's eternal life or it's perishing. That means to be destroyed, as Jesus called it, body and soul in hell. You know what non-perishable foods are, right? The ones that don't, that don't decay and go away. And Well, to perish means to be destroyed, to decay, to go away. It's not a matter so much even of one's like opinion. You know, I think hell should burn for this long or for that long, or I believe this, or this is what I grew up understanding as. It's, it's, it's just a matter of reality. Mortal people perish when fire comes upon them, particularly this fire, body and soul destroyed by fire. Now, there's another verse that's like basic gospel presentation verse that also teaches this. Uh, Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is what? Death. Did you ever notice this? It's not the wages of sin is eternal living in hell fire. It's the wages of sin is death. And Jesus called it destroy or perish the wages of sin is death. And I love the rest of the verse more, right? The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, that, that's the gospel. So we know Jesus paid the penalty for our sins, don't we? The wages of sin is death. In the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely what? Die. Adam and Eve should have experienced the second death. But with that lamb sacrifice pointing to Jesus and the promise of the seed of the woman, the Messiah to come, Jesus came and was slain for us. He took our death on our behalf. Now, did he, did he live in the fires of hell for eternity? If that's the wages of sin, then he didn't take our punishment. Do you realize that this teaching about hell destroys the gospel? It says Jesus didn't pay for our sins. That's a destructive and deadly myth just right there. Well, John says it in Revelation. You're still in Revelation, right? Let's go to 21 verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. This is hell, right? And then he says, which is the second death. The wages of sin is death. In the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. We all die the first death. Well, all those people who have died have died the first death. 
we who are alive and remain will never see death. But those who are running from Christ at his second coming experience the first death right then. A thousand years later, the lake of fire happens, and that is the second death for the lost. So we're getting some pretty crystal clear clarity on this. But one thing that's especially interesting is that even Satan is subject to this annihilation. It says, therefore I brought fire from your midst. Speaking of Lucifer in Ezekiel 28, it devoured you, the fire devoured you, and I turned you to what? Ashes. This is a prophecy about the future. Upon the earth, in the sight of all who saw you. God says to Satan, he's going to be turned to, what was the word there that started with a letter A? Turned to ashes. Now that doesn't sound like eternal consciousness and existence in hellfire. He becomes ashes. Turn to Malachi 1, Malachi 4 rather, verses 1 through 3. And this will show us the same thing about all who follow Satan. They will also be ashes under the feet. And, and what I appreciate about this text is it says it so many times in so many ways. As I was studying this out, I was blown away by the sheer volume and magnitude, the sheer quantity of Bible descriptions and references. It's as if God knew this was going to be as if. We know God knew this was going to be a tangled up mistruth, myth-infused idea where people are going to be so confused. So he says, let's come up with every way possible to describe and use analogies and use, use uh, metaphors, use, use language, verbiage, adjectives uh, to, to clearly make this as clear as possible. The soul is destroyed. It is the second death. You perish. This one, oh, you become ashes. This one, for behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven. I'm in Malachi 4, verse 1. And all the proud, yea, all them that do wickedly, shall be, what's the word? Stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up. There'll be stubble, they'll be burned up, saith the Lord of hosts. And that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. So he's just one after the other after the other to make this as clear as we can make it. But unto you that fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. And ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be, what's the next word? Ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Here's one in Psalms 37. For a little while, for yet a little while, and the wicked shall be, what does it say? No more. The wicked shall perish. And the enemies of the Lord, like the splendor of the meadows, shall vanish. Into smoke they shall vanish away. Isaiah 33, the sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has seized the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with the everlasting burnings? Now I want to pause there and ask you a question about this text before we finish the verse. What does it mean to dwell? It says, who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? What does dwell mean? What's an a synonym for that? To live, right? To live, to go on living. Who among us shall dwell with a devouring fire? Now, I want to see somebody do like a man on the street sometime with this, where you go to a place where there's, you know, people who have a grasp of the Bible, more or less, evangelical Christians, whatever. Just ask people, do you believe in heaven and hell? Yes. Now, you're, now I have a question for you. In the Bible, who is it that dwells with the everlasting fire? How many do you think will say, the, you say, the wicked or the righteous? Who dwells? 100% of so the wicked, of course. They're the ones that dwell. Well, let's ask it on the screen here. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? The answer is, he who walks righteously. The brain slightly explodes there. At that moment, you're going, Lord, you're, you're, you're changing my uh, orientation here on how I've understood this issue. Wait a minute. He who walks righteously and speaks uprightly, who despises the gain of oppressions, who stops his ears from hearing about bloodshed and shuts his eyes from seeing evil. Insert media on the brain seminar right there. What are we beholding with our eyes? What are we listening to with our ears? But you heard it. The wicked do not stay alive in the fire, do they? It says, who will be able to dwell with the everlasting fire? The righteous will. And you're going, well, that doesn't make sense. The righteous don't go to hell. Well, no, it's not hell for the righteous. When Jesus comes, our God is a consuming fire, right? 
Hebrews 12, verse 29. When he comes, some are running away, some are receiving immortality and going toward him. Lo, this is our God, we have waited for him. So we dwell in the very presence of God. Our God is a consuming fire to sin wherever found, if you will. God is a consuming fire to the wicked, but to the righteous who are putting on immortality by the miraculous power of God. The presence of God is home, and we can dwell with our God who is a consuming fire. Do you remember when Moses said, show me your glory? And God said, hold on, Moses, not so fast. We're not ready for that yet. If anyone sees my face as it is, as you are, then no man can see my face and live. So God is a consuming fire to us as unregenerated people. And there was a, a guy, though, who, who was he in the Bible? A great man of God who got so close to Jesus followed the Lord so closely, loved the truth so deeply, was so committed to God and his service that he literally was wrapped in fire and carried to heaven. Who was that? That was Elijah, the chariot of fire. Pretty awesome. And Moses got that same privilege too, to go to heaven, as we talked about the other day when he was raised from the dead. Philippians 3.19 is another one. We have so many of these, I don't have time to turn to them all or even just put them all on the screen. We're just going to rifle through a few more. I hope you're taking notes. Philippians 3.19, their God, is their God is their stomach. Their destiny is, what's the next word? Destruction. Destruction. Galatians 6 verse 8 says that the lost will reap corruption or decay or destruction, depending on your translation. Matthew 3, verse 12, that the wicked will be burned up with unquenchable fire. So we're just adding this to the, 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 the long list of clear Bible texts on this. Isaiah 47, 14, they will be as stubble, the fire will burn them up. Echoing um, Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Now you're going, okay, Scott, I'm hearing all of this. And like, all of this is a lot. Um, but... I feel like I've read in Matthew 25 somewhere about eternal punishment. And I always thought that meant that the wicked stay alive in the center of the earth on the rotisseries forever. And eternal punishment, doesn't that... Well, yes, there is an eternal punishment. There absolutely is an eternal punishment for the wicked. When they are destroyed at the second death, how long do they stay dead for? For eternity. The second death you don't come back from. And it's a forever punishment. The rejecter of Christ's mercy is never coming back after that. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But that's pretty heavy right there, isn't it? Where we go, but there's not second chances here. It's an eternal punishment. They're never coming back. But doesn't the Bible say the wicked will burn in eternal fire? Well, are they eternal or is the fire eternal? You want to know what fire, eternal fire is, by the way? It says in Jude 1, verse 7, it says that some will suffer the vengeance of eternal fire. Now, if you took only that part of the verse and built our understanding of God's character and the nature of hell on just that phrase, and we form our own opinion, this is what I think eternal fire means. Well, let's let the Bible say so that we don't have to take our ideas and impose them on the text. The Bible will always form, conform, transform, reform our ideas. What is eternal fire? <clears throat> As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Sodom and Gomorrah are set forth as an example of what eternal fire looks like. Do you know the Sodom and Gomorrah story? It was horrific, right? I mean, these terrible things were going on there, and God said, we need to, we need to torch this, 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 this oppression, this horrible wickedness. And Sodom and Gomorrah were completely destroyed, weren't they? Completely destroyed. Eternal fire came, and did anybody survive it? Did anybody stay alive in it? No. Eternal fire is totally destructive, isn't it? According to Jude verse 7. Um, the fire is unquenchable, it says elsewhere in the Bible. It completes its work. Uh, even metaphorically, it's shown a, a worm the worm shall not die. The worm does not cease its work of decomposing until body and soul are totally destroyed in hell, as Jesus said, in the fire. You know, God is a God of justice, right? That, that is something we all believe in. But isn't it God's defini definition of justice that counts? If I go, well, I think it should be this, and this is what I define as justice, well, who am I? I'm not God. It's, my opinion is irrelevant. 
<clears throat> and for centuries, the, the Roman Dark Ages Christianity taught that you have a God whose justice is torturing babies for the ceaseless ages of eternity. What a diabolically horrific thought that is. What a satanic picture of God's character that is. And it's totally unbiblical, as we're seeing here. God says, I am not willing that any should perish. He doesn't want anybody to die the second death. He says, why will you die, O Israel? Why will you die? I don't, I'm not willing that any should perish. Now, if he feels that strongly about somebody dying the second death, God forbid the thought that he would delight in keeping people artificially alive immortally to torture them for billions upon billions of years. That's a... I, I, Mind-boggling thought that that would be something that Christianity could proclaim for so many centuries. But then there's this English word forever in our English Bibles. At first glance, you're like, uh-oh, the Bible contradicts itself. Go to Revelation 20. The Bible never contradicts itself. It cannot because it's the inspired word of God. But you have to read the whole thing. You have to go look at all the verses involving the issues that we're studying Revelation 20, verse 10, uses this word forever, and at first you kind of hit the brakes and you go, hold on, what does this mean? You notice we stopped in the middle of verse 10 earlier? It says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So does the Bible contradict? This is kind of one of those problems like today you will be with me in paradise, where you go, oh no! Jesus said he was going to be in paradise with a thief that very day, and he wasn't there till two days later. Is he, is he lying? He can't lie? Does the Bible contradict? It can't. i got to solve this puzzle. Same thing here. The Bible has been voluminously clear with so many different adjectives and descriptions on what destroy means. Um, how, how do they burn forever and ever? Well, I'm going to give you relief on that quickly this time. <laughs> this is so simple. Uh, many, many, many times in the Bible, look up the use of the word forever. Tons of times, 56 times to be exactly. The, Bible, the English Bible uses this English word forever in a way of things that have already ended long ago. And so it's not a literal forever as we understand it in English. The Hebrew word for forever, let's use a few examples. The Hebrew word for our English word forever, uh, Jonah 2 verse 6, Jonah was in the belly of the whale forever. <laughs> well, that wasn't that long, was it? 1 Samuel 1, verse 22, forever means until he dies. Exodus 21, a Hebrew slave would serve his master forever or until he dies. Ooh, are you noticing a little trend there? Until he dies. That's why this doesn't contradict. Because when you look at verse 10 of Revelation 20, you're like, that doesn't make any sense in light of verse 9 because it says the fire devours them. How can the fire burn them forever and ever and devour them? Those are incompatible concepts. Forever and ever would go on in our English forever and ever and for eternity. How can it devour them then? Well, the original text of the Bible was not English. And there's just no good English word for the Hebrew and Greek words used here. It, it, it's for the period of time that Jonah was in the whale. It's for the period of time that Samuel is serving in the temple. So you want like a long, excessively um, wordy <laughs> translation of that Hebrew word forever? <clears throat> That's a stretch. Um, for the duration, for the totality of the time period in question. Now, nobody's going to translate it that way into the English, especially if you already have this, this preconceived idea about eternally burning hell. They threw the word forever in there, but you go back to that Greek, you go back to that Hebrew, and the Bible doesn't contradict. Praise God, we don't need to be wondering and worrying about that because it is simply a word that means for the duration of the period involved, for the totality of the time period in question, or until he dies, and he saw those. So, so that's why the, the, the fire can burn for this totality of the period of time, and then they are devoured. And we don't know the length of that time. I'm not going to form an opinion on that. That's God's justice and his doing and his character that will declare this strange act, as the Bible calls, of the Lord to have to do this because of what Lucifer has brought upon this, this, this world. Um, you remember the parable of the rich man and Lazarus? 
This is another one that where, where people become perplexed when they see what the Bible teaches, and then you go, oh no, all of us would seem to have, if this parable is literal, all of us would have a Bible that contradicts itself. What is the parable? Well, it, it, the parable describes two people who are alive while dead. That's already a problem. Maybe you were thinking of this one last night. I was saving it for tonight. Um, two people who are alive while dead. That can't be with all the texts we've looked at in the Bible. If this parable is not a metaphor, if this is not like the blood crying from the earth and the souls under the altar crying out for vengeance, there are metaphors in the Bible. There are analogies. There are symbols. If this is literal, then, then it does contradict. But I'll tell you something. If this, if this was a literal picture, and if this concept of, 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 of Lazarus and the rich man are both alive while dead is literal, then I would, I would like to really understand who believes in this picture of the afterlife, because it's kind of a strange picture. Have you read that? We're not taking the time to do it, because I've only got eight minutes left, of course, but I always do this to myself, don't I? Prepare too much for content. But the angel comes and takes the two men bodily when they die from the earth to this place. And so they're there bodily. One of them has a tongue, okay? So, so you're alive while dead bodily, and, and they're they're one, the, the one who's saved is placed upon the chest, the bosom of Abraham. And the one who's lost is across a chasm, and they're talking to each other right there. And you're like, I don't think I've ever heard that version at a funeral before, right? Nobody really teaches this version of the afterlife. Some people teach that you're alive while dead, as we looked at last night. But this concept is pretty, pretty foreign to anybody's notions that might be out there. Um, this whole story is an allegory. It's as simple as that. An allegory teaching a different lesson altogether. It's not teaching the doctrine of what happens when we die. Um, so you can have some relief on that, because otherwise the Bible would contradict if this was to be taken literally. And everybody who loves the Bible would have the same problem there, wouldn't they? Wouldn't we? Um, Judges chapter 9, there's, a, there's an allegory, a metaphor, a, a, a fictional portrayal that's meant to teach a literal meaning. It's the, 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 the bramble is asked to be king over the trees. The trees ask the bramble to be king over them in, in Judges chapter 9. Now, we don't believe that trees talk, of course. That is not something that we go to that, oh, oh I think I believe. No, 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 no. Jesus is pulling from popular mythology, from ideas that were common in his day to teach a completely different lesson about poverty and about righteousness and about the rewards of the wicked and the, and the, and the, the rewards of the righteous and the punishments of the wicked. Pilgrim's Progress, have you ever heard of that one? That's another allegory, not in the Bible, of course, but that's a later story that was written by John Bunyan. So using allegorical language is not meant to be taken literally. And that's something we all learned in our English classes. I know you're saying, Scott, we're aware of the concept of allegory. It's not to be taken literally. But some have looked to that text to try to explain that literally you sit on Abraham's chest while in paradise and talk to people across a chasm who have need for water. And it's like, yeah, okay. Well, whatever the Bible teaches is always going to be good news, isn't it? Whatever the Bible teaches is good news. And I, I reform my thoughts to correspond to that and accept that in faith and trust. But I also love to see how it's good news, right? And how this is beautiful and true and wonderful. And that helps me to be inspired to share it. I mean, I'm inspired enough just because it's true. The Bible says it. I believe it. That settles it. I'm inspired enough when I see that the myths are deadly <laughs> to save people from perdition and deception that will flow. But extinguishing Satan and sin and suffering from the universe leaves a beautiful future for the redeemed. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more sorrow. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, no crying. Isn't that, doesn't that bring a load off your shoulders? There's no crying in hell on the new earth for eternity. After that lake of fire event, the earth is restored and Eden restored and remade the new heavens and the new earth. Here's another one. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. That's really good news, isn't it? There's no crying in hell on the no earth. There's no more pain, no more. I mean, imagine this God reserving a sin-infested corner of the new earth 
called hell, to burn for the ceaseless ages of eternity. No, people are blotted out of existence. The devil and his evil angels and those who followed him and those who take victims and are oppressors and wicked foes of Jesus Christ will never exist again. They will be reduced to ashes and God will clean up this earth and make it beautiful and perfect for those who love the Lord, those who receive a love of the truth. So this asks something of us, doesn't it? We can respond to God tonight in our heart. We can say, Lord, I want you to have my heart. Because eternal existence in hellfire with a tormenting torture master God is a deadly and destructive myth. And I'm so happy to be freed of that darkness and that burden. How many people have seen this dark ages picture of God and then wanted nothing to do with religion? God as a child abuser torturing babies for billions upon billions of years. That is the devil's idea. God would never dream of such a thing and you read nothing of it in the word of God. How many people have tried to be Christians, conscientious people, tried to please God and then have encountered this stumbling block that the devil has put out there, this false doctrine, and it's been a barrier in their relationship with Jesus. God is that way. We want to go deep in our walk with the Lord. And he is fully trustworthy because his character is so beautiful and good and true. And God has put eternity in the hearts of men. There's something that draws us to him about that. When we learn this truth, we go, praise God. Part of me kind of always hoped that was the case, but I thought that wasn't the case. This satanic lie about God's character can be cast aside forever, and beholding God and his character transforms us. Do you know how the principle works? I talk about this in media on the brain. By beholding, we become changed. When we look at the things of the world and the degradations of sin, that starts to react upon our character, literal brain circuitry. But when we behold this true picture of a loving God who wants to end sin and suffering as quickly as possible, And who his heart goes out even to the rebellious to say, why will you die? Come to me and live. That draws me to him. And it says in Romans 2 verse 4 that the kindness of God leads us to repentance. So this is not some soft Christianity. This is a full surrender of heart because he is so good and has done so much for me. And it's proven again and again and again the more deeply I study into the Bible to be a God that I want to see more of and know more of. And I see my own sin in contrast to that. And I say, Lord, forgive me. I am a sinner and unworthy of this kind of God to reach out to me and call me his child. I've been a rebellious son, like the prodigal son. But that prodigal son came back with these words of repentance. He said, Father, I've sinned against you, heaven and against you. And even before he begins those words, the father is already oriented toward him saying, I want you back. Our confession must be made before the father. Our repentance must be full and deep because the kindness of God leads us to that much deeper of a repentance, that much deeper of a surrender. And by beholding him, we will begin to become changed and transformed from glory to glory, as it says in 2 Corinthians 3.18. When we see him as he is, we will be like him, the apostle John says. And there is no fear in love. God wants us to love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That is the greatest command. Will you surrender fully to him? Give your life fully to him tonight in this prayer. Lord Jesus, we love you and we want to fully give our lives to you, to hold nothing back because you've held nothing back and you are so good. We trust you. We love our heavenly father with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. In Jesus' name, amen.